Okay, today I'm here with Jamie Shaw. Jamie Shaw has uh, agreed to, to uh, write an affidavit for this case, and I cannot be uh, more grateful for your affidavit. So I just wanted to let you introduce yourself and maybe t tell a little bit about your background. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, I, my background with cannabis is, is uh, I became a member of the Compassion Club in 2002, uh, a director of the Compassion Club in 2004, but I was still just a member. Um, when Harper got elected to his second term, I actually went to go and work for the club as an employee, uh, and I started doing their communications. Uh, shortly after that, I became president, well, vice president and then president of the Canadian Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries. I was able to work with BC cities here legalizing, well, uh, regulating dispensaries before legalization. Um, and uh, had, have since then worked with indigenous groups and with micro growers to try and get them through the system and uh, get, get them to market. Um, and yeah, now, now we're all the way down to fighting for personal growing. So, and uh, for that point, I can't thank you enough. What was the initial plunge into cannabis for you? You've done so much, but what was that first, uh, push in the door? Um, I started smoking cannabis very early, um, and I moved around a lot and never had a problem getting cannabis anywhere. Uh, so, I mean, I was always kind of interested in, in cannabis, uh, prohibition in particular and how something could be illegal for so long and yet easily accessible everywhere that I ever went in the world. Um, it was a little hard in Japan, but not impossible even as a, as a newcomer. Um, so it's been, you know, it was kind of an ironic thing. Um, I don't like hypocrisy and I see a lot of that with cannabis prohibition. Um, so it was an interest, I, I was always interested in it from a social justice point of view. Um, I got recommended, uh, my doctor in 2002 recommended that I use cannabis for anxiety. And I thought that was the funniest damn thing ever because I was using cannabis all the time and didn't seem to be actually helping my anxiety necessarily. Um, but then being able to access the same strains over and over and over again, the same cultivars, um, finding out what worked for me, what didn't, I was really able to kind of dial it in and, and was amazed at, at how just being conscious about what cannabis I was choosing to smoke really made a difference for my my anxiety and then of course just it, it's one thing to kind of know intellectually that there's all these people that it helps but when you see them on a daily basis and you and you actually can see the difference that it makes people that doctors sent home 12 years ago to die that are doing great and they're off all their other medications and they're and they're still doing great um, other people that where it's, it's not going to really help them with their ultimate condition, but at least it makes things a little bit easier on them. Um, it, it's really hard to kind of deny or, or turn the other way when you, when you see it right up front like that over and over and over again. Well, there's just been so much deni uh, undeniable uh, studies done and research that's out there. So to your point, it is hard to, to, to look back at the old ways of thinking on it. Um, how have you thought uh, recreation has gone in Canada over the last two years? Um, about the way I thought it was, um, I, I've kind of always known, like, the, even though I've fought for legalization, um, I've always known that it wouldn't really work for me. Um, I, I, I smoke, I smoke joints. I, it's going to be a long time, if ever, where, before we're actually like allowed to smoke joints like inside on a rainy day. Um, you know, the cost is a factor, um, but it's, it's part of the problem when the government gets involved in anything, people say regulate it like tomatoes, but it's like, if you've gone to see how tomatoes are regulated, they're actually, it's pretty strict. The same thing it's like milk is regulated and eggs is regulated. And, you know, all of these things kind of add costs and extra steps. And I think the hope is that we can kind of pare down to just the ones that are necessary, but I don't, I don't think we're going to be in a, in a decent place for legalization for maybe another 10 years. And to, to the point that brought us uh, brought us together, uh, growing cannabis at home recreationally, have, have you done that yourself? I have not. I'm not very good. At, well, I mean, I, 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 I've grown plants, but really it was just for decoration. Um, I'm, I'm not a very good grower of anything. My, my plants, all plants just kind of don't do very well in my apartments and I move a lot and I travel a lot. And so it's, it's, I'm, I'm one of the perfect examples of somebody who's physically capable of, but there's no way it'll take me a, 20 years to figure out how to grow the cannabis that I like to smoke and to be that good at it, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a perfect example of, you know, just because you can grow at home doesn't mean they're going to. 
No, that's a good point. And, um, you know, to, you, you mentioned you live in apartments, you know, one of the big, uh, big pushbacks is there, there's going to be regulation on people in apartments. Well, people in apartments have have friends who live in houses or abilities to grow their own. And we see this in other provinces where people who have the ability to grow gift it legally to uh, to those who can't. So it's, uh, you know, there's well, some people I'm, who I'm, won't grow. So go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also hoping that we see a model at some point where you can go and rent a space to grow your four plants. Like there's, there's no reason that that can't be allowed. In fact, it would meet a lot of the government's concerns because then it's no longer in the household, right? And it can be in lockable spaces. And so just the way we do storage lockers now, turn, turn those all into grow spaces and let people rent a space and grow. I, I like that model. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to ask you, uh, what is your a stance on the Manitoba government's ban on, on homegrown cannabis? I, I've read your, uh, your draft affidavit. I, I know your feelings on it, but for, for everyone watching, <laughs> Love yeah, to it. it's it's aggravating. It makes me so mad. And so reading the government of Manitoba's case, they haven't brought up one single thing that hasn't already been looked at by the Supreme Court, by federal task force, by the Senate, by jurisdictions all over the world. It's the same arguments that they're bringing up again and again. And, and mostly it's arguments that have been refuted or are easily work aroundable, right? Like, oh, you're worried that the kids are going to get cannabis. Well, if they're growing it in a closet or, or, or a greenhouse anyway, put a lock on it. How difficult is that, right? It's not that difficult, but no, no, no. We'd rather have like $10,000 fines and, you know, just ridiculous things. And, it, and it's, it's, it's aggravating because it's, it really comes down to the politicians are now playing politics with it. And we see the more conservative governments still pushing that same kind of argument, even, even when it came up in the Senate. The, at the end of it, the conservative senators that brought the amendment in the first place were like, well, okay, we can leave it up to the provinces. And the liberal senators were like, no, you leave it up to the courts. That, that's, you know, production is not a provincial jurisdiction. Um, so, I mean, they're just, it's just more of the same where, where they're just playing games. And, and in some cases, you know, at least with recreational cannabis, we're not talking about necessarily life and death unless there are people that are having a hard time actually accessing medical. And, and maybe they do have the ability to grow four plants at home on their own without having to go through the medical system and waiting forever for their license renewals. So um, it's, it's still important. I agreed on all points and uh, I cannot wait for the Manitoba government to, to read your affidavit uh, among the others we've prepared because it's it's going to be undeniable uh, facts that they're going to be met with as opposed to what seems to be their method of throwing outdated arguments and hoping it sticks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's, it's the, the frustrating thing is, is that works for them, but I don't think it's going to keep working. Right. And it's, it's kind of stopped working um, a little while ago. They just haven't really caught on to that yet. So hopefully that trend continues. I, I think, I think we'll be adding to that trend. Um, so I guess in closing, uh, do you have a message to Manitobans as they wait to grow? There's, there's a lot of people who are eagerly excited to see this ban overturned. Uh, do you have anything you want to say to them? Uh, nothing I can probably legally say, <laughs> but, um, you know, yes, gifting is legal in Canada. Gifting of seeds is legal in Canada. So, you know, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I understood. Uh, yeah. Well, I really <laughs> appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this interview and for, for writing that amazing affidavit. And, uh, oh, thanks so much for having me and, and thank you really for doing this I, because this is, you know, this is not something, okay, maybe you get to grow four plants, but that, that benefit doesn't really necessarily equal the amount of work and, and effort that you're putting into having to go and challenge the government in the first place. So thank you very much. It, uh, it's not a problem. I, I, it's the best cause that I, I can put my foot forward on and um, ha having yourself join is just uh, solidified that this is such a good cause. So it makes it all worth it. Nice. All right. Well, th uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be talking very soon.